Okay. <laughs> when are you ready? <clears throat> Should we start from st the start? My name is Santo Pizzuti, and I was born in Fontana Fredda, Italy, uh, a long time ago. <laughs> My hometown is at the foothills of the Alps. And the fresh waters would come down through the pebbles, through the rocks, and then finally become streams. And they contain catfish, a lot of catfish. And the catfish, when they're spawning, uh, are very lethargic. They 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 hardly move, and uh, and as a kid, uh, I liked to, to touch them. And I was on my way uh, one day, and I was wearing a a red beret. I guess I was four years old or so, and there was a, a bull in the meadow that I passed. And evidently it's true that they, they don't like red. In any case, the bull charged and uh, hit me and took my cap away. I was bleeding just over my eye and I still have a little scar. I don't remember what happened after that. But my parents went out and, and retrieved the, the, the cap. There are very few memories from way back, uh, but at, at we finally came to America. When he came to this country, he and uh, his baby sister, his, his, they, they came with their mom and his baby sister, Norma. Santo and Norma were tiny. Um, Santo seven and Norma three, four. Grandma Pizzuti apparently was terribly sick, seasick the whole time. My mother was fed in her cabin and I, with my little sister, would go up these great stairways to the dining area. And they had people in first class take them under their wing and take them in to have every meal, first class meals, all the time because they were two little cutie pies. So they had ice cream every day. Uh -huh. And Liberato was... Uh, It'll be so, after the first time up in first class, the first class dining room, it wasn't too hard to get Norma to go up the stairs because ice cream was at the top. On the trip, on the boat, all I remember, I don't remember too many sunny days. Um, it was... Uh, mostly cloudy. I remember the water being green, dark green, not blue. I, I don't remember blue waters. Uh, and I remember dolphins uh, always in, in front of the boat, uh, uh, ahead, of, ahead of the bow, and, and, and staying with us for days, for days on the Atlantic. I remember coming in to New York Harbor where uh, I saw the Statue of Liberty. When they pulled into um, Ellis Island to the, to the dock, uh, he saw his father waving. I don't know how his father could spot him, but he did, and he, he was waving from the dock. 
and that meant that we had a great reunion. But the next thing I remember, going through Ellis Island. And Ellis Island was nothing but a, a great big cavernous building with thousands of people milling around, but mostly within cordoned lines. There were ropes that people were headed into. And at about every 20 feet or so, there would be a doctor, and the first doctor might check the eyes, and the next doctor might check the ears, and the next one the lungs and so forth. But it was no, nothing but a milling crowd, a big, big, big crowd. Entering school in America, uh, I learned very quickly that uh, my, my dress was not proper. First of all, th this was a period when all young men had knickers and I had shorts, short shorts. <laughs> and uh, I also wore shoes that were handmade, handmade shoes that had a strap. And he was actually made fun of for his hand-sewn Italian leather shoes, if you can believe it. <laughs> and of course, uh, I, I didn't understand the, the kids who, who were razzing me, but uh, I knew that this would not do. I had to give up those shoes and those shorts. Uh, that was rectified right away. A couple of years later, uh, there was a bully who would uh, follow me and then punch me out. And uh, he was about three years older than I was. And uh, my father heard about it. So he, without my knowing, he uh, shadowed us. And when the kid came over to beat on me, uh, my father punched him in the nose. <laughs> and he had a, a bleedy nose. And of course, he went home complaining. And my father was brought before the judge, the local judge. And the local judge balled him out. And he, <laughs> he just chastised him. And don't do that again. And that was it. That was it. So I was very pleased with that. Of course, he never, never, never came near me after that. Do you remember Grandpa Pizzuti hammering fish? Oh, yeah. Well, do you remember what that was for? Yeah, it, it's called, I have, to, I have to have the name. Um, it, it was actually codfish. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this has to do with uh, historical, it's historical. When the Roman Empire <laughs> was flourishing, the uh, Norwegians didn't have iron, they didn't have steel, and they would swap codfish, dried codfish. So the uh, codfish was considered the important part of Easter. You serve that at Easter time. While codfish, when you buy it, dried codfish is like a board. It's as hard as a board. And uh, my father would take it down the cellar and put it on the anvil, and he would hammer it until it broke it up into small splinters. And uh, then at that point, it's put into boiling water 
and it's boiled for hours and hours and hours. And then there's a sauce that's added to it and it makes it uh, more palatable. I never liked it, <laughs> but it was more palatable. But it, that, it goes back all those years. It goes back all those years. And uh, I haven't seen it since, you know, since I was young. But he would hammer away at it for a long time. At some point in grammar school, they test you and, you know, they say you should really take up an instrument. So he decided on the violin. I remember the, the, the violin being such a precious object. And uh, so I practiced, I took lessons. Santo said he uh, liked to play it and could play Turkey in the Straw and a few other things. And so they had a recital and he played the bear went over the mountain, the bear went over the mountain. The bear went over the mountain. And he didn't know how to finish it, so he just kept going until somebody finally got the hook, I guess, and got him off the stage. We were tested, and I came in last. So I knew that music would not be my career. <laughs> but the funnier part about that is um, his parents must have just dreaded him practicing the violin because he was so terrible. And they needed a, um, a door for a room on the third floor so during the Depression they could rent the, the, the room out on the third floor. So they traded his violin for a door <laughs> without asking, but I don't think he was too upset about that. Good trade. It turned out. I remember during the Depression, the government would hire pe people just to give them jobs. For instance, they would hire a group of young women to, to, to teach how to stretch a dollar in cooking. And I remember a group coming in to teach these Italian ladies. Uh, <laughs> and the first thing they showed the ladies was that uh, if you take Campbell's soup, <laughs> you start to make a gravy. <laughs> And the women, uh, who had good manners, and had all they could do to keep from laughing, uh, this just laughed later, laughed and laughed and laughed, and 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 I'm still laughing over that one. I had bought a, a car. I, was, I wasn't allowed to drive yet. I wasn't quite old enough to drive, but I bought a car. And uh, Rudy and I, we decided that the car needed a valve job. So we, uh, we pulled the engine apart and we did a valve job. And then we put all the cable wires back in place and uh, and started the car and it started surprise it started I put it in first gear and it went backwards I put it in second gear it went backwards and third gear it went backwards I put it in reverse and it went forward so we scratched our heads and wondered what in the world how and how, how could this happen so we pulled the wires off again and then replaced them. Well, in the replacement, we evidently changed the sequence 
and from then on the car ran fine. We asked the mechanic how that could be, and he said this is a one chance in 10,000 that, that you would hit such a problem. Rudy and I also built a boat. We decided to build a, a, a 12 foot uh, kayak. And of course we didn't buy new material to build the kayak. We used old canvas uh, from tents, old tents. And we put this thing together in the cellar, in my cellar. And we checked the size of the door, and of course the uh, kayak would go through the door. What we didn't check was that, that right after the door, we had to make a sudden left. And they, at the end, tried to bring it out of the basement and realized that they had built a boat that was too big for the door. So we had to pull it back into the cellar, pull it apart, take, take it outdoors, and put it together again. We then also designed a contraption that would connect the boat to uh, a, a bicycle. And one of us would ride the bicycle with the boat behind it, and the other guy would run next to it to the nearest water hole, which was in Nutley, New Jersey, and we sailed poorly. But anyway, we enjoyed <laughs> that this was a, a happy moment for us. In the summers, I took a job in Belleville, New Jersey, uh, with uh, sign painters, <clears throat> two poor sign painters, and they paid me $2 a week. I'll never forget them because the first thing they would unload when the car c came in, uh, they would uh, they would unload the, their uh, uh, cigarette butts that they had picked up. They couldn't afford cigarettes, so they had paper, and they would re-roll uh, cigarettes. They had a uh, a wreck of a car that was spattered with paint because they they painted billboards and, and often the wind would carry loose paint onto their car. In any case, they taught me how to use a brush and the feel of, uh, of loose brush strokes, which was very valuable to me when I went out looking for my first job. In other words, I, I, I found myself being a professional the first day I went to work <clears throat> because of that background. <clears throat> uh, by, by the way, they, they still owe me uh, $2. The responsibility lies on the shoulders of one man. By his latest act of naked aggression, Hitler has committed a crime not only against Poland, but against the whole human race. The about this time, uh, I was about 16, uh, I got a strange letter from Mussolini. The war had started then in Europe, and uh, evidently he was reaching uh, anybody who was born in Italy a letter came from Italy to your father, basically drafting him or, or calling him to uh, Mussolini's army. Of course, I was stunned by it because I didn't know any better, but uh, I, I was a citizen of the United States. And you know what my grandfather does? He crumbles up that letter and he throws it away. The idea that the letter made it to him in New Jersey is kind of some, some, what, some relative in the old country was nice enough to forward, oh, forward it. Yes. Okay. But it really uh, unnerved me for a while because I wasn't sure. And of course, I did eventually ignore it. But it was a, a strange happening. 
uh, that I'll remember. A little later, when I was graduating from high school, the war was getting uh, uh, wider, uh, and the, the principal of the high school, <coughs> of my high school, came to me, <coughs> and he asked if I would go with him on a secret mission. Santo went to Nutley High School, Nutley, New Jersey, and he was very good at art, and he was very, has very good technical skills, um, mathematical and technical skills. I was brought to this house in Nutley, New Jersey, and the secret mission was uh, the Norden bomb site, which our Air Force had started using with great success, great success. The Norden bomb site, what it is is a lens that had site-specific images inscribed on it so finely that through the lens, the bombers were able to, with pinpoint accuracy, take out targets during World War II. And uh, the lenses were shown to me, and you could see uh, graphs and charts that were worked into, into these lenses. He was offered the position of working on that project. And I told him that I wanted to think about it because at that time in World War II, unlike all the other wars since then, uh, people felt patriotic. They felt that they want to be part of that war. And the beat of feet sounds over the land. Feet intent on training, on growing fit for whatever destiny holds ahead. Heroes, every one. Heroes by the million. Men who abandon home and vocations that they may be ready to defend democracy if necessary. And a lot of my friends had already volunteered and I didn't want to be, uh, treat myself in any spe special way. Uh, probably foolish on my part, but I turned it down. I turned that down and I volunteered for the Army in instead. <clears throat> The Army sent me to Cornell along with a lot of other young men to study Italian and geopolitics. The objective was to uh, have us be fairly well versed in, 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 in Italian. The purpose of it was when we took over a town, our job was to move into town and uh, administrate that town. That was the objective. It, n it never happened because we were as far as the POE, the port of embarkation, when the war in Europe ended. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. Reporters rush out to relay the news to an anxious world and touch off celebrations throughout the country. Joy is unconfined. At one point in the war, I was uh, in charge of a group of Italian prisoners, counting the prisoners. They had to be counted every day. And I, I did this for about a month, and Italy had had quit, and the Italian prisoners were helping us whenever possible at this point. So we were treating them in a special way. They were actually allowed to go to town. They, they were allowed to date if... if, if. <laughs> And the, the Italians had 
very little to do, and they were given rations, which they got. They got flour. So here, here they were at their, at their uh, dining uh, and kitchens, uh, and uh, sitting on the on the front porch and sitting here and there, mixing things. And twice I was invited to dinner. And the dinners were about like a better restaurant, a New York restaurant. <laughs> now, the whole attitude, that was one attitude. The Germans felt that they were prisoners, yes, but their country was winning. And therefore, tomorrow, they would be our peers, you know, our, our supers. So when the whistle blew to be counted, the doors of the barracks would fly open and the, the soldiers were on a run, on a super run, and they'd all form in line with, without, without the eyeballs moving. And I remember going down the lines and not seeing anybody except maybe one or two soldiers who, who dared to t turn their eyeballs to follow me. And then when the count was finished, uh, the whistle blew again and, and in, into the barracks they would run full speed. There was never a smile, there was never any, any, anything like that. That they were sure that the uh, war would would uh, turn would would they would win. The, 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 as far as they knew, they were winning all the time. They didn't know that they were losing. They didn't know the big picture. In any case, I I had this job to to transport a group of Italian prisoners to Kansas and uh, by train. One of the prisoners was a colonel and I sat next to the colonel and at one point he saw a glow out in Pennsylvania and it was nighttime and uh, he said, what, what, what's that glow? And I, I said, that, that's uh, steel mills. And he said, we were told that they were all bombed out, that they had been bombed out. And then later he asked if I would like an, an espresso. And I said, where, where are you going to get an espresso? He had a duffel bag, and he pulled out a, 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 a coffee maker. He had it with him in, in the war, and he set this thing up on the windowsill of the train, and within half a minute, he made his espresso. And, and then made one for himself. And, uh, and I'll never forget that. The Italians really were not for the war. They, they finally uh, killed the dictator. They finally killed Mussolini. Uh, As far as my work is concerned, <clears throat> I, uh, I was very f fortunate uh, throughout my career. I started out in uh, Newark School of Fine Industrial Arts with a scholarship, a full scholarship. But I didn't finish the scholarship because there were so many veterans taking art courses that I thought 
I, I don't want to be out there with these thousands of people uh, vying for a job. I felt that I had uh, spent three and a half years wasted and I wanted to work and I wanted to get on with my life. And uh, so I uh, put together a portfolio. Most of it was prepared at, at the art school. And I also uh, included some watercolors that I had done in the Army, in Texas mostly. And I, uh, I got a job right away. About six months after I started working at that agency, uh, an art director who had left this, this same agency was at the AMP agency. And he called me and he said, they need an art director here. Why don't you bring your portfolio in? And I said, art director? Uh, you know, I've only been in the business seven months, eight months, you know. And he said, never mind. He said, uh, I know what you could do. So I, I said, okay, I'll bring my portfolio in. And uh, evidently I had a good meeting. The head, head art director liked what he saw, but when the final decision was made, he made it in favor of somebody from BBDNO, the great big agency, New York agency. Well, about two or three weeks later, I got a call again from the same art director who uh, told me that the guy they hired had borrowed somebody else's portfolio in getting his job. And they discovered that and, and fired him. So, we'd like you to come back in. However, we're going to ask you to do a layout for us so that we can not be fooled again. <laughs> And uh, so I, I came in and, and, and got the, the, uh, the copy and I went home and I uh, did the layouts and they were easy for me to do. And I sent them in and uh, I got the job. I worked as an art director for about three weeks and uh, the, it, it seems the president was having troubles with uh, his senior art director. They had about four or five art directors and he called the head art director in, opened up his drawer and pulled out the layouts that I had made and he said, I want this man to take his place. And lo and behold, I found myself as a senior art director and I'd been in the, in the business, what, <laughs> about six months, <laughs> no, a little more than that, about 10 months. Do you remember the first time you met Gert? Yeah, I met her at the Newark School of Fine and Industrial Arts. We went to evening classes, and I remember offering to drive her to the bus stop. And, uh, she was a neat gal. Neat, neat gal. <laughs> yeah. Her family and my family were uh, po poles apart. 
her her father was uh, had had uh, taught law, and uh, he was also later a lawyer. Her brother was a lawyer. Later, he'd be a judge. And uh, my father was a stonemason and and bricklayer. So our, our our worlds were kind of apart, but we had we had everything in common, you know. When we were young, my brother wasn't born yet, but when the three girls were young, he and his buddy started a storybook farm. Ken Peppy was a dear friend. And he, he and I, <clears throat> I, I had a, a, a miniature house that I had built for the l and Cigarette Company. It's the filter that counts, and l and has the best. You get much more flavor, much less nicotine, a light and mild smoke. And then I inherited the house when it was over, and I had it in my backyard, and I came up with an idea. Why not have uh, a lot of houses, a lot of buildings, uh, and have a farm for kids. Here he was with a young family commuting to New York to Madison Avenue Monday through Friday and on weekends he and my godfather Kenny went out and leased some property out on Route 46 in Parsippany and in the backyard they put together um, the three little pigs houses and they put together a great big boot that they used for the rabbit houses. There were baby lambs for Mary Had a Little Lamb, followed her to school, so there was the schoolhouse. Uh, baby goats for Billy Goat's Gruff. So that when I went to kindergarten and the teacher asked me um, what my father did for a living, I said he was a farmer. <laughs> and they painted all the nursery rhymes, Santa did. So we had a bunch of stuff in our backyard for a long time until they went out and set it up and opened up Storybook Farm and got a lot of taker, a lot of people came through. The first day it opened up big time, like Disneyland, but there was no Disneyland at that time. The parking lot was full and uh, one evening the pigs got loose. <laughs> they, bro they broke through the fence and they were found wandering on Route 46 and the police called us and uh, actually they came back. They came back uh, the next morning. They found their way home and it, it was doing pretty well. After I think the second year a car would come into the parking lot with two or three men with cigars and it was obvious that they were checking on it to see if there were possibilities of going into the same business on, on a bigger scale. And uh, sure enough, uh, several started different states and then I guess uh, after that, uh, D Disney opened up and of course super scale, you know. Un unlimited monies. We weren't interested in running it as a company. We we were only interested in, in building the uh, these fairyland buildings. So at some point we sold the farm to the manager that we had. But anyway, it was a, a, f a fun period. We enjoyed that. We know about Greg Santa. <laughs> that oh, he has a doll named Little Miss No Name. They and they cost a lot of money, and they're 
and they're not pretty. They're not pretty? They're not pretty. They look sad. They look sad. You need a sad doll. Little Miss No Name is a doll uh, that, I, that I did uh, with great big eyes that I thought, you know, all dolls are very, very pretty, very cute, and very tailored, and very well cared for. And I thought, why doesn't somebody design a doll that is an orphan, a little orphan? who needs care, who needs attention. And so I, I designed this thing. My kids were young. And I d designed this uh, a doll with raggedy clothes. It has patches on it. And the eyes are sad, and there's even a tear in the eye. And uh, Gert would be up on the porch with soap flakes and dropping those while I'm making a shot of this little orphan doll in the woods in a snowfall. And she would be dropping these while, while I'm photographing. Then one day I, I, I was talking to a photographer and we were walking across town and I told him about this doll that I thought made sense. And he said, well, I, I do work for Hasbro, Hasbro Toys. And uh, he said, I'll be glad to show it for you. So I, I gave it to him. And uh, sure enough, they, they bought it. They bought it. And they had uh, G.I. Joe at that time. G.I. Joe was there leading doll. And they tested G.I. Joe and they tested my doll in several city, cities, Chicago, San Francisco, and I think somewhere in New Jersey. And I got paid for it. It was, it was just a test though. And they had to decide on, on whether it was G.I. Joe or, or my doll. And they decided, I guess the reaction was stronger with G.I. Joe, so they went with G.I. Joe. In any case, the doll is now in a doll museum. Um, that's something that uh, I kind of enjoyed doing. Gert was a beautiful lady. And in fact, a New York photographer tried to get her to, to do some advertising poses, and she would have nothing to do with posing. She didn't want to be a model. She wanted to be an artist, commercial artist. Well, anyway. So she, she's all dressed up, and we're, uh, the family is in, in, in Italy. I believe it was Sunday, and we were all hungry. And we asked the taxi driver if he knew if there was a restaurant in the area, and he said, oh, yes, I'll take you there. And it turned out to be Alfredo's. And there was an outdoor garden patio that was lovely, so they sat us there. Nobody else was there because only Americans, you know, have dinner at 6.30 or 7 o'clock. And evidently we were dressed for some occasion because we were traveling, so we didn't, we just wore traveling clothes most of the time. Well, since I was all dressed up, and Carol and Diane and Gert looked really good, and these people had no idea who we might be. So um, my mother always thought that they, they must have thought we were somebody. Apparently, about the same time that Sandra and Gert and the two older girls were traveling in Italy, John F. Kennedy was president and traveling with his family in Italy. And so there was a belief that 
the, well, the rich Americans had accompanied the president, and so Santo and Gert and family should be treated as the way you would treat the Kennedy family. And so Alfredo came over to serve, to actually make the fettuccine Alfredo. And he went through his routine, which was uh, which was uh, cooking on a, on a little table next to our table, and. Uh, and, and it's almost like a little dance where he's, he's doing fettuccine. And he gave uh, a scoop to each of the other three people. And then he picked out Diane, like a bullfighter picks out a lady to give his uh, the tail of the bull to, <laughs> to the final lady. He gave this big slop sloppy platter <laughs> to Diane. <laughs> <laughs> and we had never even, I had never heard of fettuccine Alfredo before. I think Santo had. We didn't know that it was a special place until we went in to find the ladies room and the hallway was lined with photographs of Alfredo with Kennedy and I mean just all the movie stars and it was good fettuccine Alfredo too. <laughs> they must have thought that we might be somebody but, but, but they, they couldn't, they didn't know. They didn't know, and they couldn't ask. You know? yeah. <laughs> so we got treated special. A little later, I decided to uh, to go to a bigger agency. I got more money at Dancer Fitzgerald, and then about. A year later, I became the executive art director. And so I felt very comfortable, finally, you know. Then all agencies changed in, in the sense that it was discovered that they, f they functioned better creatively if they did not have a head art director. If they had single art directors with writers, a team. And so I found that I had best leave, I left. And then took on with uh, Bob Harris. The two of us working together came out with Smart Balanced Foods. Bob Harris called me, uh, asked me if I could come to his house and work with him. Um, he, he was looking for the, to name a, a new company that he had just started. And when I got there, he showed me maybe 10 or 12 different names that he had come up with. The objective was for me to take these names and turn them into graphics, into uh, logos for, for a, a, a new company name. And, uh, and so I, I, I started working on several. But I realized that the FDA will not accept certain names. And uh, so I knew that it was f futile to uh, continue on, on those that the FDA would not accept. And at some point, Bob Harris went to the bathroom, and that was my opportunity to come up with a, a name. And Santo scribbled this name down and scribbled some, some design down. And When Bob Harris came out of the bathroom, he looked at it and uh, I could tell that he liked it a lot. A little while later, his wife came down from the second floor and she joined us. Uh, she didn't sit, she just sat, st stood there and looked at th this latest uh, logo. She said, who thought of Smart Bounce? Um, and then the guy reluctantly pointed to Santo. He didn't mention my name. He pointed to me. 
it was pretty obvious that he really didn't want anybody to know that anybody other than he came up with these things. So um, at some point, about six months later, the company got started and got started in a rush. It, 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 it did extremely well, extremely well. What cooks like butter, spreads like butter, and has a fresh dairy taste like butter, without the cholesterol and high saturated fats? Smart balanced buttery spread. I think it's pretty impressive being able to create what became a, a billion, potentially multi-billion dollar brand uh, in the time it took somebody to go to the bathroom. I don't know how long the bathroom trip was, but uh, either way, uh, pretty impressive. And uh, he, he, of course, went on and became a, a wealthy man. Uh, and I'm still, I'm still working with him. Not, he sold the, that company, and he's he now starting another company. My other activity is uh, boating boating, which I enjoy a lot. When I was first moved to Monmouth Beach in the summertime and took sailing lessons, Dad had a little Comet sailboat, and when I'd finished my lessons, he said, okay, you take the boat out by yourself without me. And I said, no, I'm nine, I can't do that. And he said, I trust you, you can do it. And it gave me great self-confidence for a long, long, long time. So Santo was 48 years old, and the family moved down to Rumson and joined Mama Boat Club. And he had not ever raced a sailboat before. We, we bought an albacore, which is a, a, a two-man boat, and I, I crewed for him for a year or two. When Santo turned 79 and was still um, racing, I thought, well, how much longer can he do this? So I'll start to crew for him again. And uh, we competed in bridge races and what are called bay races out on Sandy Hook Bay. And over the course of uh, at least 20 years, Santa was the fleet champion. He doesn't like day sailing very well. He likes racing. But he does seem to like to go out when there's gale force winds. That's, the, that's his you know, that's the time that he's most comfortable. We have a, a, a Sanderling, that's what I sail, a uh, trophy at the boat club that has the winner of the uh, Sanderling every year for about 17 years, and there's only one name on it. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad, glad to say it's mine. The main thing about Santo is his integrity, and the reason that people really like him and spending time with him is because exactly what he's saying is what, uh, what he means, and he, he really loves a lot of people, and uh, that's him, that's Dad. Did a lot of traveling with the agency with Dancer Fitzgerald. I enjoyed it all. I was very lucky. I enjoyed it all. One of my favorite stories is the birth of Uncle Dave. Uncle Dave was born on my granddad and granny's first date. Liberata Pizzuti didn't tell anyone she was pregnant at all. So granddad went out on his date with his future wife and when they came home he was told that he had a little brother and that was Uncle Dave. One of my favorite stories that Santo tells is about a night that he and Gerd were invited to Liberata's for dinner. His 
little brother, Dave, is my mom's age, and their mother, Liberty, would say, like, this is Santo, your brother. And he came to the door and greeted Santo by saying, Santo, my brother. I think Dave had been learning English from Liberata up until that point. While fighting in the army, he figures out, or thinks to himself, well, why don't they just put a ridiculously long rake on the front of these vehicles so that they can activate the ground mines and not injure people? So he tells all these people, he ends up drawing all these pictures, he meets with people about this, and I don't know what they told him, but probably, yeah, thanks, thanks anyway, but yep, now they exist. Thanks, Santo. There's a couple things that I've been learning more recently. One is the whole, his name was Santa uh, when he came over. I had no idea, found that out today. It had something to do with um, getting a terrible Christmas tree. This seems to be a, a popular story among the Pizzuti yeah. family. They went to get a Christmas tree on like Christmas Eve, and there was Slim Pickens, and the only Christmas tree left was like a twig, and they decorated a twig, and that's gone down in the Zuti family folklore forever. All right. <laughs> yeah. Are there, are there any other? Um, Bachi. Bachi. Who's played Bachi with Great Santo? Me. Yay! That's fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because he still wins. Yes. Still wins. And he still wins. We love you! We love you! We love you! Serial and filming serial and shooting serial. For years it had been done in a bowl that you couldn't see through. Who knows why they decided to do that because obviously you can't see the serial. And Santo one day said, you know what we should do? We should put it in a glass bowl. Time to power up with Cheerios! Here! Toasty Power Rolls of Oats! A breakfast with Cheerios and milk is packed with vitamins, muscle-making protein, and energy for go! Get yourself a bowl, get Cheerios. That way we can see through it, we can see the milk, we can see the cereal, and make it that much more engaging. So, that's pretty cool. One very, very clever man 